Travel Growth Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Travel Growth Podcast. I'm Tom McLaughlin, founder of SEO Travel, and this is where I speak to successful travel business leaders, dig into the successes, challenges and learnings from their experiences over the years. So you, the listener, can take away actionable advice to enhance your own businesses and maybe even lives too. My guest today is Tom Bodkin. Tom is the founder of Secret Compass, an organization that pushes the boundaries of what is possible, taking people, brands, and organizations to corners of the earth, which many say isn't possible. This is a great conversation that I really enjoyed, and there's no doubt that Tom has some fascinating life experience to draw on, which informs how he runs the business. We discussed Tom's background in the military and what he learned that helps to drive Secret Compass forward. We also cover working with his co-founder, Levison Wood, and how to make that co-founder relationship work, as well as Tom sharing loads of fantastic tips on how to create an effective wider team. Tom also shares some of the incredible expedition experiences he's had over the years, and there are some mad ones in there that will no doubt get your travel juices flowing. Uh, And we also get into leadership, failure, marketing, and lots more where Tom gives some really interesting insight. This is a really super episode, some really unique insights from Tom's previous experience. And yeah, hope you really enjoy it. So here's me talking to Tom Bodkin. Tom, hi, welcome to the show. Hi, good to uh, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Um, you have clearly had a lot of extremely interesting adventures over the years, and Secret Compass is a, a super interesting business from from what I've learned about it so far um, and I'm sure it's going to highlight some really interesting stuff for, for people who are listening and lots of lots of lessons to learn so um, yeah looking forward to getting into it. Oh, thanks very much. Um, so I thought we'd kind of start right back at the beginning and look into like when like what what first you got got you interested in travel when when was that like what can you can you paint a little bit of a picture for us? I guess, you know, in terms of like travel generally, it was um, like a lot of people, you, you sort of leave school, leave home and you, uh, you start to go out into the world. And um, I, I ended up in, out in Malawi in Southern Africa when I was, when I was about 18 and um, travelled through Malawi, travelled through, down through into South Africa. And I think that was, that was the first time where, you know, I was, I was truly independent. I was uh, um, sort of had the big wide world at my sort of doorstep and I think that was probably the first time that I uh, um, really sort of uh, started the you know a, a passion for travellers. Tell, tell us more about that then so what why, why were you doing that what prompted was that like a gap year kind of before uni after school that that took you on that? Yeah so I um, I decided I wanted to go out and, and work um, in out in the Alps so and basically try and ski every day or snowboard every day so so that's what I did for, when I was 18 and then after that I uh yeah I had a an opportunity to get out to Malawi I actually had a one of my great aunts lives out there so I went out to initially visit her and then went off on my own around the country which was which was which was great as a really a sort of good learning curve for someone who's 18 I mean lots of people have done it at that age and um it's it's uh yeah it's it's a it's a really good sort of um, way of becoming sort of independent by yourself out in a in a very, very very at the time very strange kind of culturally different place was that was that with an organization was that something kind of set up or was it literally just you no, I just about? I just did it independently I just did it by myself yeah um, so you know traveling on um, mini buses or or local buses or um, or hitchhiking or, or whatever to get around the place where did that sort of spirit of adventure come from? That's a pretty, because obviously there's loads of people who go away when they're 18 and they'll go with a charity or they'll go somewhere on a project and, you know, all the pieces will be sorted out for them. But that's a pretty, that's a pretty big thing just to wander off into Malawi and see what happens. Um, yeah, I mean, hey, I did have a bit of support in that, you know, I initially stayed with um, stayed with family members. So, you know, I, I don't think it was it was too much of a sort of jump. So, um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought I, I didn't really consider any other sort of option, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I thought if you're going to go out and, and do, you know, go and do something you want to do it on your terms and, you know, go and, go and move on when you want to move on or stay if you want to stay. So um, I think that's that's 
the certainly the um, the the approach we, I had at the time. How long did you do that for? Uh, so good question. I it's probably a couple of months, two to three months, I think. I'm trying to remember. Uh, and then I we went on to I went on then you know off to to um, Australia and New Zealand and then out around to uh, Southeast Asia for a little bit as well. So yeah, it was great. It was good times, but long time ago nice. now. Yeah, yeah. And did you was it was that like a pre university? Did you come back and go to uni or? or yeah, that, I did. Yeah, yeah, then I went to university. Yeah. Uh, and what did you? Can you can you kind of give us a bit of a potted history of going from uni, like what you studied at, at uni, through to starting Secret Compass, and and then I'll probably dive into a few of those bits after after that. But if you can like connect the dots, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I studied geography at university, and you know, people normally study geography because they can't think of anything better to do. So no one's really passionate about it. It's, it doesn't really lead anywhere. So. Um, managed to get away. I, I did my dissertation out in, in South Africa, um, looking at sort of education in, in townships in South Africa. And, um, and then after uni, I got a job working for um, an organisation that does take gap year kids around. So uh, it was an organisation called Quest Overseas who organised kind of projects and um, expeditions for uh, um, young adults between the ages of sort of 18 and 21. And so I um, worked with them, helping to run those those projects and expeditions around South Africa, Swaziland, um, and Southern Africa, really, for, for a year. And for, so from there, and then did, is that what led into going to the, joining the army? Um, I'd, I'd, always, I'd wanted to join the army since I was about 15 or 16. So that, that was always the plan. But um, I sort of, committed to um at least a few years of service so yeah i did that for a year and then i, I and then i went into the army right okay so you so yes yeah, so you'd worked so you'd worked for the gap year organization when you yeah when you when you were doing that was it a clear kind of i'm gonna do this for a year and i i'm, I'm kind of lining the army up to go to that or did you just kind of do it and slowly it just ran its course and you thought right i'm I'm, re- I'm ready for the next thing now. Yeah, no, I was always going to I was always going to join the army after university. So I just delayed joining for um well, actually yeah. initially for 6 months did did, did a, a first job with this organization and thought I'll tell you what, they offered me another another opportunity so I thought I'll do that I'll, and I'll delay the army for another 6 months. And um yeah. so yeah, so I, um which which was great. It was good to get out and uh run around sort of southern Africa for a little bit before before going in. And and what was the motivation? You said you 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 wanted to join the army from from when you were sixteen. What was the like? What was the motivation for that? Um, well, I think I I knew that I didn't want a, a sort of desk job or a traditional career. Um, you know, I c- couldn't imagine going into the city or doing anything. Um, you know, uh, sort of commercial, if that makes sense. So, um, and you know, I like liked sort of running around a bit. It sort of thought that the uh, there was there was a nice bit of challenge there as well, which is always kind of appealing, you know, interesting, varied, every day is different. So, yeah, I think that's what what appealed to me. Did it turn out how you expected? Did it live up to it? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, and and more to be honest, um, because uh, you know I I was I was there at a very busy time. So yeah, no, it was um, it definitely lived up to it. There's definitely, I mean, a lot most people join the army join because they've, they've got kind of a sense of adventure really and want to go and. Uh, and uh, yeah, have have a little bit of fun, and um, and it certainly fulfilled that for me. Yeah. Um, tell us, tell us a bit about that period. Then, how long how long were you there? What sort of you know what sort of things were you out? I think you were out in Afghanistan and, and and places like that. What yeah? How how did that period in the army look for in terms of like what you were doing and where you were going? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I joined in sort of two thousand and five. Um, so just after the uh, invasion of Iraq and, and just before we went into Helmand anyway, into southern Afghanistan. Um, and I joined the parachute regiment. And um, so I had a yeah very busy sort of six, six seven years, um, which was uh, a mixture of um, training. So I went and did things like jungle warfare instructors course, did a couple of... Um, 
training trips out in Kenya, which is really, really cool, really interesting. Um, also, um, uh, traveled a little bit, you know, did some training in, in Malawi, funnily enough, went back to Malawi, uh, a bit in Cyprus, and um, and deployed twice. I did two tours to Afghanistan. I did, I did one with three para in 2008, and then, and then another one with um, one para who, who uh, in sort of 2009, sorry, 2009, yeah, busy both operationally and and in um in, in sort of peace time as it were um so yeah full-on really enjoyed it i was very lucky with the roles that i had and um and what i got to do can you so our, our uh kind of connection initially came through a friend who was uh who was with you there and even when i'm having conversations with him i'm always trying to delve into like what is it day to day like <laughs> with something like that? So you you mentioned like obviously your train, you know, there's all those different pockets of you you're doing training in different places for certain periods, and then obviously you're there. What about like as being part of the parachute regiment? What's what's the you know there's there's obviously there's some jumping out of planes going on there and, and things like that. What what can, can you I guess can you paint a picture as much as you you know as much as you can? Just some of the like nuggets that people might. I don't know, give them a better understanding of, of what, what it involves. Yeah, sure. I mean, so when I was in, it was it was very operationally focused. So we always knew, okay, we're going to be going up to Afghanistan in 18 months or two, you know, or in a year's time or whatever, whatever it might be in, in the roles that I had. So everything would be sort of focused around that. There'd be a cycle. And so depending on where you are in that cycle. So if you've just come back, there's a bit of, you know, um, give, give the guys um, a bit, quite a bit of time off you know keep the tempo quite low um and then it kind of builds up again as you get into the operational cycle so first thing you're looking at doing is is building up those kind of those individual skills so it might be driver training might be getting the guys trained up on different weapon systems and then that builds up into um training in small teams and then and then bigger teams and then um to finally you, you have a number of sort of test exercises that you'll do before you then deploy. Um, and that sort of strings itself out over a year and a half, kind of two year cycle. And, um, and so depending on where you are in that cycle, depends sort of what your day to day life's like. Um, there's quite a lot of exercises. So going away and, and exercising, you know, di different levels, depending on, on, what, on what you're trying actually training abroad. Um, and then obviously you, you then deploy. So you then, um, uh, you know, at the end of that sort of period, you go and deploy, do six months or however long you're doing, and then come back and it starts again. Yeah, yeah. So, so you did? Did you say you did? You were there for sort of six, six, seven years, doing doing that in those cycles, and then d did you come out of that and go straight into Secret Compass? What? To, yeah. What? What was the kind of connection from leaving the army into you know into kind of where we are today? Yes, my, my last job was um, was was an office job, funny enough, in the MOD in London in Whitehall, uh, which is not what I wanted at all. I thought I'd sort of teed myself up to go and, and do a, a training job in, in Brecon in South Wales, and I thought that was in the bag. But I was um, uh, I was I was actually out on the ground in Afghanistan. I got a radio call from my boss, and um, yeah, I wasn't very happy about it. So anyway, <laughs> but it, l luckily it turned out to work out you know I had, a, I had a great boss at that time I had a really kind of um a couple of really good colleagues and uh although working in office in in Whitehall wasn't my idea of you know why I joined the army it actually meant that I had a bit of time and space to work out kind of what and, and prepare for for leaving you know the following year so it actually worked out okay so you were so yeah so you were sat there basically coming up with the plan for what you were gonna, what you were gonna do afterwards? Yeah, to, yeah exactly. Yeah, to an extent, or, or trying to come up with a plan. Yeah. And was and was that secret compass as it as it is now, or or was the were there kind of steps to yeah steps towards it? No, not at all. Hey, these these things evolve pretty quickly. So, so actually, my I mean, my initial idea, what I wanted to do was go to Canada and do another ski season and basically go go skiing um, all day. That was kind of the primary aim, and. Um, I also wanted to sort of the idea was to build a business that um, you could operate remotely, which you know nowadays doesn't seem that difficult. Um, but yeah, that you could, you could operate remotely, and um, 
And obviously the ideal was it would pay me a, pay me an income and I wouldn't have to do very much. Um, which, um, yeah, definitely do, is, uh, doesn't happen. So the, that, that was a sort of naive dream. But, um, so the original idea really was to develop, um, a, a sort of website where you can connect with local providers. So, you know, if you want to go mountain biking in Chile, you know, you go on, you look, find Chile, and you've got some mountain bike guys that you can contact. That was the original idea. Um, and then we decided that we thought it'd be a good idea to run an expedition to, to raise some money, basically, raise some capital, put into this business, because we figured out that, well, we quickly figured out that building a decent website costs a bit of money. So, um, so we just, we thought, well, we'll do a trial, trial trip to, and we thought, you know, where, where should we go? And we looked at a couple of different options. And um, decided to, to stick with the Wakan Corridor in northeast Afghanistan. And um, as the first trip, I mean, a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, both myself and, and Lev, who I set it up with, were, um, you know, we both just done, I'd done a year in Afghanistan. He'd done, you know, six months. And, um, you know, we were interested in going back and seeing a different part of it. Um, we also thought that we had some credibility there, um, potentially, maybe not, but such as incredibility around taking people there. And, um, and we also just wanted to go there because it was fucking cool, you know. It was a really, really remote part of the world, um, really um, interesting place culturally um, with the Waki and Kyrgyz people, very interesting historically, you know, with the um, uh, great game being played around there back in the, in the late 19th century. And, um, and also from a sort of, uh, yeah, f- further back than that with Alexander the Great and the Oxus. It's quite, quite an interesting part of the world. Very few people have been there and, um, and it looked like quite a challenging thing to do. And, and so we thought, well, you know, this, this, this probably sounds right for our, our first trip. So we, we set up, advertised it and, you know, no idea if it was going to be successful, if anyone would join. And we managed to get sort of six or seven people to, to, to join us to think we, you know, um, which was amazing. Um, I'm not quite sure how we did that, to be honest, looking back, but somehow, somehow we did. And, um, so, uh, so we run the first trip really as a kind of proof of concept, you know, see, see if we could do it, see if it works. And we did it in, in July, sort of 2011. So I, I literally left work on a Friday and, um, in, a, in the MOD and flew out to Tajikistan on a Monday. So it was a, it was a seamless transition from that perspective. And um, you yeah, went out, did the trip. It was very successful. Everyone had a great time, and um, we even made a little bit of money, which was amazing. <laughs> and so we we thought, right, let's um, let's you know, this is a, a good model. And we'd also um, with the the build of the initial website, basically fucked up the the brief. Well, actually, the the, the web developers who we we got in to build our website um, were. Well, they they'd been bust two or three times. You know, they they were essentially um, uh, not very good at, at what they said or couldn't deliver what they said they were going to deliver. So we ended up losing I don't know something like fifteen hundred quid. You know, uh, on a, on this website, which was pr- pretty significant at the time. And yeah. so we thought, you know what, we we know we know we don't, we know don't know anything about websites. We don't know anything about SEO. We don't know anything about. Um, you know, building a platform, but we do know a little bit about running expeditions from, you know, my experience previous prior to the army and also our experiences within the army. And so we thought, you know what, why don't we, um, why don't we do this? And so we came back from there and built a plan for how we were going to launch the next year, 2012. And um, so we uh, came back, uh, developed a number of trips the following year and, um, and decided to go sort of full operational um, at the beginning of 2012 with a, a trip to South Sudan. Ace, so, so, so yes, yeah, so you, you had the idea to have the sort of techie platform with lots of stuff going on, but yeah, like you say, the, the technical bit of it proved to be too much of a, <laughs> too much of a stumbling block to get over. So, so you kind of reverted back to that like expedition, go and, go and run stuff model. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was kind of, hopefully it's where our, our strengths lay. Um, yeah. And also, um, it was just more fun. We were much more motivated about it. You know, we, it was the sort of thing we wanted to go and do. 
and you know we we had a, a very quick sort of um, you know review of why are we doing this you know what, what which I think happens quite a lot when people set businesses up um, and you've got to be in it for the right reasons you've got to be motivated for the right reasons and obviously part of our motivation was to create something that gives us an income but obviously also it was to have a bit of fun because we weren't really interested in doing something that we didn't enjoy yeah yeah and and how does it look now so that was what 2011 2012 you know we're getting on for getting on for 10 years later what what does the business look like now who's how many people in it like what's the you know what's what's going on with it yeah so in terms of like operationally it looks very different you know we've got sort of 10 or a full-time staff um we've got um uh but we've we, we've sort of transitioned so we, we still have a uh, an adventure travel business. Obviously, it's pretty quiet at the moment due to COVID, um, but it still exists. We still run a number of expeditions each year, um, and we still do um, uh, sort of more custom-made or bespoke trips for people um, each year in the adventure travel space. So, so that's still part of what we do. Um, but we also have a quite a large um, risk management consultancy in the TV and film space, so um, working with TV um, crews uh, to look at the trips that they're doing the f- um, and help them come up with ways of, of you know, reducing the risk, help them in, in the pre-production phase of risk assessments and safe plans, and then, and then um, provide consultants who can, who can go out with them and um, help either manage that risk or you know, provide medics who can, who can help support them on the ground. Yeah, cool, cool. So, what, so what's, what's that, that growth, growth been like? Has it been, been, has it been, has it been kind of fast, fast over, those, over, those, over those nine, 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 nine ten, ten years? Has it been, has it been, has it been steady away? away? Any, Any kind, kind of bumps in the road, road along, that, along, that, along that journey? Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, it's, it's been really steady. I mean, the type of business that we are, um, especially, well, actually on both sides, the travel side and the TV side, is really, we, is, um, a lot of our growth comes from word of mouth and from reputation and, as a result of that, it's, it's quite slow and steady growth. It's, it's pretty solid growth, you know, it's pretty reliable. Um, and hopefully once you've, you've got to a point, because you've developed that reputation, um, people continue to come back to you, so it's, it's unlikely to fall off quickly. Um, whereas if you're a kind of, I don't know, a tech business or a fashion business or a bar, you know, you can fall out of favour relatively quickly. Um, hopefully once we're built, we're, we're relatively, relatively solid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but no, so it's been slow and steady. And, um, you know, it's it's actually been randomly sort of like in line with what we forecast, which was a, was a bit um, unnerving in many ways. But, um, but you know, we, we grew pretty steadily as a travel business um, over the first sort of four, five, six years um, and then sort of plateaued out. I mean, our, our expeditions are, are great. They're, they're really, really... Um, they're, they're fun, but they're, they're definitely at the sort of hard edge of the adventure spectrum. And as a result of that, the, the market's not huge, and um, uh, there's only so many people who want to go and do some of the some of the stuff things that we do. So um, I, I think that's got a, a sort of limit in terms of the, the, the market um, on the expedition side. Um, but we've been continually growing through um, through the TV and film business um, throughout. So. So that's been great. Nice. You, you mentioned when we when we chatted last about the kind of switch into the risk management around COVID and around the pandemic and stuff. Um, and when we talked about it, you said it wasn't like an operational thing, but more like a marketing and salesy type thing. T- tell us a bit about that, about how you did how you did that. Was that a uh, yeah? What what was the like you say? This obviously within what you were doing, there's not really much change. What but what did you do? To, to push that out there and drive that bit part side of the business. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess there's there's two elements to that. There's there's kind of when we first started running TV and film trips back, you know, right at the start. I mean, it, it basically happened. Um, I think I told you when we, our second trip to South Sudan, I got a phone call from from Lev, who was back in the UK, who'd been approached by a TV company to ask him to come out into South Sudan, and. Um, uh, and then we, you know, he flew out three or four weeks later with the with the TV crew, and we we helped run that trip. And all the, operationally, what we do is very similar. We're taking people to remote places, right? So we need to think about the same things in terms of 
be if we're doing the logistics piece, um, but also the, the safety and risk management piece, whether it's a group of what are essentially tourists or whether it's um, a film crew, you know, going through the jungle to, to film, you know, elephants or, or, or primates. So um, it's, uh, it's essentially the same thing operation, it's just marketed different. And the same was true when, when COVID came about. So we were actually dealing with COVID back in, in January with a team in China. Um, and then we started looking at it for, you know, all the, all the shoots that were going out anyway, because there was a, a risk of COVID coming, coming in. And, um, and then when lockdown hit, we were helping people film in, um, during lockdown um, on, a, on a very small, small scale. And, um, and so we were already sort of doing it. I mean, the COVID risk management is very similar to, uh, you know, every other sort of risk management. This is the same approach that you, you take. Um, and you just got to understand what the, the hazard is, which is, you know, COVID and then, and then what the kind of key mitigations are. So, um, it's, it, it was, it felt very natural and we'd also done it with other diseases like Ebola in the past. Um, so, um, but also what we did was, although our approach was the same, to, um, we developed a, a specific, you know, tool to market, um, because we saw that obviously co COVID, um, risk management on, on TV productions was going to be something that was going to be, um, uh, very important to get people back to work. And, um, and so we uh, changed our marketing. We set up a, a specific uh, um, website around it. And we also um, put together a, an online training package for COVID, which has been really successful. Right. And those two things really helped um, cement us as having a reputation for, for COVID risk management in the, in the TV space. Yeah, super. Um, you've mentioned Lev uh, a couple of times. So this is Lev Wood, who people probably probably know by now. Is is like went and walked the Nile and has done a lot of a lot of TV stuff. Um, tell tell us a bit about the co-founder experience. So uh, you know, I I started the business on my own and I, I run it with my wife, but it's it's quite a sort of separate separate thing. There's you know we've got our own. I think divisions. we need to hear about your co-founder. <laughs> no, yeah, no. um, but the the how how did you go did that just happen naturally when you yeah when you kind of rolled into it did you have specific things you agreed on that one of you would handle one thing one of you handled the other yeah what how did that work yeah so i mean i we i said that we left back in in 2011 and um and uh he was around until he he went and walked the nile in sort of 2013 i think off the top of my head so if it was, you know, we we worked together for a couple of years on the business before he went off and, and did the, uh, the the Nile and, and the subsequent walking trip. So, um, uh, but it's quite a long time now, so I need to refresh my memory. But yeah, we um, yeah, I mean, I think having a co-founder is really, really incredibly useful in many ways. Um, it um, enables you to um, obviously split the workload, it enables you to motivate each other. You know when one person's kind of got a, a little bit of a, a downward, you know, or has a bit of negativity, the other person can bring them up. Um, and also you bring different skills and, and different perspectives, which is, which is really useful. And um, I think it's really healthy um, actually to d disagree on things because it, it shows that you're challenging each other and, and um, you know, the, the last thing you want is, is to both have the same sort of thought process towards death because you'll end up both making the same mistakes. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think we, we had a really positive relationship um, in terms of our approach. Um, we, we definitely thought about things differently, which I think was very healthy. And um, and yeah, in terms of roles, I, I took on a more of an operation role, and, and Lev took on a more of a kind of marketing and comms role. But the um, um, but uh, but yeah, I think the um, certainly in the early days, uh, having a having a co-founder is, is really important. Obviously, they need to be. You know the right person, and you, I think the key thing really is you need to be aligned on your on your aims of you know what you want to get out of the business, um, and why you're doing it in the first place. I think if you're aligned on your the bigger picture on the on the on the bigger picture aims in terms of like why you're in it, what your motivations are, um, then that's that's the key thing. If you if you're not aligned on that, then then you it may cause um, cause you know issues in terms of where you're going to go. And um, 
Uh, so I think that's the, that's the key thing. Is, it's just alignment on aims and and alignment on the you know what you want to achieve. Um, disagreement on how you then go about to achieve it is probably a good thing. Yeah. And and when it got to the point where it, obviously the, like the the Nile stuff came about, how did that? How did that pan out? How did that feel? Because I guess that must be a hard thing when you've started this thing with someone and been doing it for a couple of years and it sounds like it's going well and then it's just like, oh, he's off. <laughs> um, well, yes and no. I mean, like the, um, it wasn't a massive issue. I mean, you know, you've got to be pretty grown up about these things and, you know, talking about aims and alignment, you know, Lev's kind of life, life aims had, had evolved and changed over those couple of years and he wanted to, you know, do something slightly different, which is which is fine. You know, people, people, ch- um, you know, motivations change. So that wasn't an issue. And um, and actually, obviously, with the trip, we ended up supporting um, the uh, the film crew and doing all the all the sort of risk management for the NAR. So, from a commercial perspective, you know, there was there was a benefit to us there as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, there's no, no sort of issues from 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 that really. It was it was a you know, a, a very ambitious project and one that, you know, I certainly always fully supported from the from the start. Yeah. Did you, were you tempted, did you or were you tempted to try and sort of replace him and bring someone in along, alongside you or was that just kind of like, all right, I'll, I'll just crack on and do it now? Uh, yeah, well, we did, re- we did, we employed someone to take yeah. on his, his roles and responsibilities. So yeah, we, we employed someone to, who came in and, and um, took those on before he left. Yeah, cool. Uh, so kind of carrying on down the, I guess, the, the sort of team rabbit hole a bit, but you talk about team a lot on the website and, and teammates and, and obviously the importance of those. And, and clearly in the past, when whether it's in the army or expeditions you've run, that kind of relationship with the team is, is very important. So tell us what you feel like makes, makes a good team and I guess makes a good team mate as, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, let's frame it in the context of the expeditions, right? So, um, we we do talk about that for on our on our expeditions on our and um, there's lots of reasons for that. One is we want everyone to pitch in and help out. Um, so you know, we want we don't, we don't want it to be a sort of a, um, a, a I guess a a client um, relationship where. You know, people are sort of sitting back and us running around doing all the work. We want everyone to to, to work together. Um, so that's there's a kind of practical reason there, but also for, from the other reason we did is is in terms of the experience of the individual people. Um, I think really enjoyed being part of a team and really enjoy you know working together um, to to you know achieve something and um, and so that's the kind of motivation behind it. But but in terms of like how does it work practically, I think. The first thing you need to do is is everyone needs to be aligned around an, an aim and a goal. And on an expedition, that's really simple, right? Because each the whole you, you know each expedition needs to have a purpose. It needs to have an aim. You need to when you set out on day one, know what you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, you're walking aimlessly through the jungle. So the um, so having that that sort of group goal is quite easy to create and quite easy to align people around on on an expedition. Um, Obviously, everyone's motivations are different for being there, um, and so understanding what people's motivations are is um, is, is really important, and, and that can come come out through you know discussions, people talking about why they're there and what they want to achieve and what they want to get out of it, and I think that's important for everyone to understand. Um, and then really, it's about sort of setting the example and creating the culture as the as a leader, as the expedition leader. So it's. Um, it's showing kind of what what you expect of people, asking them, you know, early to um, uh, yeah to, to to pitch in when they when you'd like them to pitch in, um, creating the the the, the kind of um, everyone for each other culture rather than everyone for themselves culture, and um, if you can do that and create that quickly, then um, everyone, I think everyone certainly in my experience has really brought into it and really enjoyed that experience and and. You know, on those trips, again, this is using this as an example, but you you very quickly uh, get to know people who, um, you know, you've never met before, you know, within a period of a few days and get to know them pretty well. I get to know their strengths and weaknesses, their character traits very, very well. 
And so you end up being, you know, quite close to people who you, in normal day-to-day life, you know, may never strike friendships up with. So, yeah, it's it's. Um, I think people get a lot out of it from, from those reasons. And and how does that tr- does that always translate successfully in, like you say, with the expeditions you're running with, you know, consumers off off the street who signed up for a trip? I, I assume a lot of the time those people are just kind of landing in the place that you're running the expedition and that's the first time everyone's met. How totally. how do you how do you sort of bridge that gap for for people who you don't know who they are and you don't know what their makeup is and if they're necessarily kind of built for, for that kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, t- you know, th- these things are quite self-selecting in terms of people who turn up are normally sort of... Um, capable and and uh and up for it and also you know we're, we're creating things that are uh um, suitable for just the ordinary active person you don't need to be superhuman at all so we, we rarely have problems with that but i think in terms of the um in terms of kind of yeah how do you bring them together luckily the circumstances bring them together you know um they've they're, they're there for the same reason they all want to do do the trip they um they've all sort of flown in and they've all got a similar just by the nature of them being there, have got a similar outlook in life. And so that's the kind of common denominator that, that transcends, you know, nationality, culture, you know, um, uh, profession, etc. cetera. Um, so you, you, it, it's very quick that people sort of um, start learning about themselves and about each other and start, um, uh, yeah, I guess, um, bonding and, and working together as a team. Yeah. Uh, how have you applied like what you've learned in in terms of the team from the expedition and the army stuff to the sort of boring sedentary office world <laughs> of, of running the business? <laughs> like, does yeah, is are there things that you can take there where you you know you can map you can map them onto the, that different environment? Yeah, I think so. I mean. The you know the um, uh, it, it was obviously a very different environment and and um, the uh, so so you, you I guess you need to recreate those things. So I think ensuring everyone's you know again this comes back to the you know why they're there, understands the purpose, understands kind of what we're, we're trying to achieve is is really important. Um, and, and creating those those opportunities for people to. Um, get to know each other better because in day-to-day life in the office you don't necessarily get to know each other that well um and especially at the moment you know when people are working remotely your interaction might be a one hour zoom call each day which is quite limited so um i think finding those opportunities to for people to sort of do things extracurricular as it were to get to know each other well is kind of a really important part of it as well um and obviously open communication ensuring that everyone's uh, the, the communication channels are open, not in terms of kind of just what you're doing, but also just you know wider in terms of um, ensuring everyone's uh, uh, happy and is able to communicate things if they're if they're not you know happy or comfortable with what they're doing. Any recommendations for those extracurricular things? Just go to the pub or um, or, or all the secret compass team out in uh, yeah out in the jungle <laughs> doing something. Hey, yeah. you, can, you can do all sorts, right? I mean, you can go pat, pat rafting down the local river. You can go paddleboarding. You can go, um, yeah, I don't know, horse riding, climbing, you know, surfing, sea kayaking. There's all sorts of things you can do. Play football, you know. Yeah. Anything. There's, there's lots of yeah. things you can, ask, you can do. Love it. Love it. Um, Let's go on to the kind of you mentioned the the marketing side of things a, a little bit. I've I've read in something else in another interview that you gave where you said initially you were you were naive in respect to marketing and, and selling. It has that has that changed? How how did that yeah, how did that you mentioned like that when you first started out you got your kind of six or seven customers. Where where did that come? How did you get those first six or seven customers? Yeah, I mean, I think the, we, we were naive. I, I also am not naturally very good at it. I don't like, to, you know, chatting about stuff. So the, um, I'm not particularly good at marketing. 
or, uh, or or engaging with it. But we, yeah, we got those first six or seven through um, partly through our own networks, so you know, friendship groups and networks. But also, we were lucky enough to get a couple of shout outs. I think we got a shout out on like Escape the City, which is a a um, a website lots of people will probably be aware of. And um, we got got a few a couple of people through there. I think that was that was really successful. So yeah, I mean, we, we did it through the, the sort of channels that you'd normally do, trying to um, trying to sort of exploit other people's kind of communities and um, and our own sort of networks to try and try and um, get our first cu- customers. Um, but yeah, in terms of like marketing more generally, yeah, I, I'm not particularly uh, um, good or at it or get, end up getting that engaged with it. But I think the the thing I have been engaged with, and the, 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 the I think the central um, or a, a key thing is just to ensure you get the brand right. You know, you get a you, you get a brand that communicates kind of who you are and what you're trying to do, and um, uh, and you, you nail you know the basic stuff like the name and the, the logo and kind of who you are and what you're about. And where do those? You, you meant obviously, I guess the the TV and and support of that side of things is a is a, a different a different element. Let's stick with the more the consumer angle bit of it first. Where y- you mentioned before, like you've got a niche, a really niche market. How do, do you know where those people are coming from? Is it is it completely random? Is it just word of mouth, or can you see the particular kind of approaches that have been successful in? getting under the noses of people who are prepared to go on your kind of trip? Well, the, our challenge really is that our, our clients are very varied. You know, they, 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 you know, they have some things in common, like they, you know, have a similar kind of sense of adventure and, um, you know, they have a similar sort of approach in terms of their sort of attitude to life quite often. But that doesn't really put them into a marketer's box. And so um, they are very varied in terms of their background, profession, age, nationality, where they come from. Um, you know, it's not like they're all climbers and you can advertise in a climbing magazine. So um, it is um, it is very challenging to target our audience, to be honest. Um, that's the, the thing that we found the hardest is, is even though we've profiled them and, you know, look, worked out who they are, it's... Um, they're they're incredibly varied and so targeting them is 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 probably the our biggest challenge i think and when they come in could you do you ever see like oh yeah we've got we got some pr coverage here and we can see that that's brought in a few you know a few of the right people or is it literally just like people from every strand every time in a different yeah people from every strand every time i mean you know pr can be successful and, and cannot be and Funny enough, our most effective PR, you know, was was a sort of like three or four lines in the Sydney Morning Herald about our Afghanistan trip. We've got about four four sales, I think, from that. You know, and we've had we've had absolutely nothing from you know double page spreads in national newspapers. So it's it 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 kind of comes and goes depending on you know what it's in and how lucky you kind of end up being with who, who's read read it. But um, so yeah, it's um. It's definitely an, an interesting sort of part of the challenge, I think. And then on the TV side, you've said like it, it's very, you know, that I guess the industry talks. So has that just been a word of mouth thing where you've become you've become known for what you're doing, or is again, is there anything kind of particularly active that you've done to, you know, to to develop that? Yeah, no, that's that's purely word of mouth. And so you know, you work with someone, and then you work with them again, and then they recommend you to someone else for you know something they're doing and um and it just ends up being a, a, a word of mouth um industry and that's the same if you're a cameraman a sound guy you know um a producer it's, it's exactly the same you're you're basically taking on your your network and your reputation so yeah it's very difficult to go and market on the on the tv side on the kind of i guess the you know when you're talking about getting people behind the same goal how do you articulate that for the for the business like like what you've you've mentioned kind of fun and adventure being like some of your key drivers behind you know having having the business 
is there is there anything else that you have there in that mix to get everyone behind you know behind the same thing um i think it's yeah i mean it's about understanding um kind of where the business wants to go really and so hopefully understanding what the kind of um strategy is moving forward and and the big picture um approach that you're taking um and uh so i think that's that's a key part of it and then in terms of the like having fun piece i think it's part of the kind of culture that you set in terms of the the approach and the way that people work together and the way that um um people are sort of um way, way that people are managed so that they they are in a i guess an environment that you want them to be in how do you choose where you go tom so when you you know you, you mentioned south sudan and, and afghanistan what what are the is there a sort of blueprint for this is a good place to go for an expedition or do you yeah is, is it a you see a place and you like the look of it and it's like right let's go and see what we can do there yeah it's a big mixture to be honest um we basically we we want to go and do something that we we we'd like to do that's the kind of first criteria like we you know got to say we want to just go and do something that's fucking cool and if it if it hits that criteria then then it's probably worth looking at and um so that's part of it but then you've got the kind of i guess the boring practical elements of like well actually on a big picture level it's kind of that does does it is it cool does is it somewhere that is going to attract people and that could be because of the, the place the country itself you know drc or afghanistan attract people or, or is it the the um what you're doing itself so you know abseiling off angel falls is an example um that that's kind of like got a big headline that will pull people in you know what's the usp so I, and um and also whether or not it's it's got a a clearly defined sort of purpose to it so rather than just you know wandering around the jungle is it you know we're going to go from here to here are we going to get to the top of this are we going to you know descend this river what's our actual purpose why are we going there what's the point of it um and so if you get the, the narrative right and the and the place and the country and the activity and they all come together, then then that's what we're looking for. So it, it's not kind of one criteria, really. It's it's, it's all the different elements of it add up and stack up to be something that, that we'd like to do. And I guess you must work with a lot of people kind of on the ground, like local partners with this kind of thing, given the, the kind of places that you're going to. How... How easy is that to do? Like, is there a lot of bureaucracy that comes into that? Lots of red tape, kind of, yeah. How's, I, I, I can imagine that being a challenge to, to set some of these things up. Yeah, it totally depends where you are and where you're going. And um, But the we do have a relationships, obviously, with people everywhere we go. And the strength of those relationships and, and what they do depends on where we are and what we're doing and their capabilities. So in some places we we do a lot of the work and the the local team might just be um, you know translating or helping us out as um, in terms of like you know very very local kind of guiding element or um, the they might just be you know uh, doing a little bit of local logistics so it really depends on where we go and what we do um, but uh, but yeah a, a, a part of the the planning is the bureaucracy piece. That's a way that can always be overcome. Uh, you just need to understand, you know, who you need to speak to and how you need to speak to people, or what you need to do and how you need to, yeah, make things happen. What What are the? Have you got any examples of like the biggest challenges you've faced with with the? Uh, yeah, I guess with the business, I guess, we'll maybe take that on a bigger scale uh, in terms of your whole experience in the build up. But like within the business itself, any particular? Yeah, any particular stories about things you've had to get around? Well, I think you know this in the, in this current time. I don't. I think everyone's biggest challenge was COVID, right? Last year, when when um, uh, when lockdown hit, you know, we we had no revenues for three or four months, um, and obviously, it was also a very uncertain time in terms of the uh, for staff, and you know, not what not. Understand, not knowing what you know what what the future held so I think that uncertainty um, was very challenging for lots of people and so I think COVID has probably given everyone the, the biggest challenge that they've had for you know for, for a long time um, 
and certainly that was no exception for us. You know, we we had, had the, the the first and you know few initial months was quite challenging in terms of understanding, um, what, you know, the impact, what, how to manage the staff, how to uh, take things forward, what 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 you know, how, how long can we keep going for? You know, what's our cash flow forecast? So there's lots of different elements that that I think COVID brought into the mix last year, which um, uh, definitely superseded any previous challenges. Any anything on particular e- expeditions? Any any yeah, anything kind of while you've been out on the on the ground? Yeah, people always say this. They always like assume that there's going to be like <laughs> some disaster. Yeah. Goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, I don't know if it's because you know maybe because we we hopefully plan these things properly. But we've had. We've been very, very lucky and had um, very, very few sort of issues. I mean, personally, I've had no sort of major issues on on, on trips at all. And um, as a as an organisation, we've had very, very few issues. You know, we've had a couple of medical incidents. Um, you know, people have you know, broken legs or that type of thing. But we've always got a very solid medical plan in place, so we know exactly how to get those people out. So. It's been um, so. It's just enacting a plan, really. So, yeah, we we've, we've been very very lucky, and um, in terms of the um, uh, the the challenges, I think I'm just racking my brains for for you know for something. I mean, we did have one that sort of pops up when we we ran a trip to Socotra, got probably seven or eight years ago now, and um, uh, that was by in order to get into Socotra. Socotra is an island off off well off Somalia and off Yemen um stunning places known as the sort of Galapagos of the Indian Ocean and um the guys were flying from from Dubai through so they you know touch down in mainland Yemen some people get on some people get off and then they fly to Scotia and when they touched down in 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 Yemen um they were instead of staying on the plane um they were asked to get off a plane and then overnight before they then went on to Socotra, and I think the plane was then going on to Sana. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I got a sort of slightly distressed phone call from one of the one of the guys on the trip who I, who I knew, and um, saying they want us to sort of get off the plane and stay stay in this town, and uh, um, so I just said just stay on the plane, and so which is what they did. They just stayed on the plane, and they ended up um, not getting kicked off it and, and going on. But I think. Uh, you know, of all the trips we've done to all the different places we've done them, that's probably as dramatic as it got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's one of those things, I guess, the, I mean, again, like you said, the the planning element is the thing that offsets so much of that. And then I guess there's maybe a bit of the, the amount of experience that you've got and obstacles you've had to overcome in situations you've been in that, you know, it sounds like you're gonna just take that kind of stuff in your stride that uh, others others might uh, think there's some sort of horror show going on. But uh, yeah, it's like like you say, if you just know what the next steps are and you see it through, then it doesn't need to be a it doesn't need to be a big drama. Yeah, no, exactly. And there's always kind of what we call like little frictions, whether that be you know local transport or bureaucracy or um, uh, little challenges that sort of pop up um, along the way. So there's always little frictions, but we've yeah so far managed to overcome them right yeah how do how do you find the like you know the i guess the like the business challenges versus the uh yeah more like expedition or stuff stuff you had with the army like how how do those things compare is it a like for like it's just what comes up plan for it and enact the plan or or is there stuff where i don't know almost it, it, it's a bit more uncomfortable when you sort of sat and you're yeah, I don't know. This this random business stuff of random people who <laughs> you can't predict what they got to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess you know, it's a good question. Like, um, I, um, you know, I think hopefully with with business as well, what you're doing is you're coming up with a, a strategy, right? And then you're working out how you're going to execute that strategy, and um, and obviously circumstances will change, things will pop up. Which means that 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 needs to change and evolve, but um, I, I guess our approach has always been to have like a framework plan. You know, you know where you want to go. You've got an idea about how you're going to get there, but then you're 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 flexible enough to 
to adapt it and to change it and take on um, new opportunities if they turn up, come up. And um, and so you're you're not kind of rigidly following something. You're you're constantly kind of reviewing it, giving feedback, and and changing things and adapting and and moving forward. So um, and certainly like you know my operational experience has been that you know there's that kind of classic old saying isn't there? No plan survives contact with the enemy. So you know what certainly happened in in um, when I was serving on operations is you'd have an idea about what you want to achieve. You, you've had, you've got a kind of framework plan in place and then that would change very, very quickly, pretty, pretty frequently. And so you'd be constantly adapting, constantly um, reviewing, constantly trying to understand what, you, you know, where you now are within the sort of bigger picture and evolving what you're doing around that kind of framework. And, um, and so I think, yeah, if you apply that to, to business as well, that, that certainly can help. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Are there, are there any other like businesses or I don't know causes, charities, any anything like that 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 inspire you? Like things that you you follow and you think, oh yeah, I want to be you know want to be like them or I like those things that they're doing. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's loads, lots of businesses out there that um are pretty inspirational and uh, um. And you know we you sort of yeah keep keep an eye on them as it were and and look at kind of what they're doing what they're trying to achieve you know there's some some sort of British classics there's people like Finisterre who are doing some pretty interesting things and um, and about how they sort of are, are taking things forward so um, so yeah I think I think uh, I'm just trying to think of some examples off the top of my head um, as that if if there's so listen if nothing springs to mind that's fine like is there if even if it's not an example like where are there are there places where you other places that you get inspiration so even if it's not like an existing thing like that you get your ideas from or yeah things you've got to do with the business other people i, I don't know where, do, where where does that come from or is it just being in the zone and kind of working it out for yourself from your past from your past experience um no it's, it's a good question the uh yeah um I think, to be honest, you, you find inspiration from lots of different places, don't you? You know, you find inspiration from, um, you know, books you read, from media you consume, from TV, from, you know, talking to, you know, friends and colleagues. And um, everyone gives, you know, you get lots of lots of little things from lots of different sources. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at rather than having this sort of like single um, idol or hero or, or you know, um, that, that we'd like to sort of emulate and follow. Um, I think, you know, there's some things you look at a, a company and you think, oh, wow, their branding's amazing. Like, I love what they've done there. Their website's great. You know, you look at others and you think, actually, what they're doing with their product's amazing. You know, they're really f thinking forward. Others you look at and you think, okay, how they're managing their team's really impressive. So I think there's lots of, like, different things that you can pull from from different different places. And I think that's kind of more the the approach that um, that we take. Any Any particular books? I knew you were going to ask that. I'm so shit. At, I don't even remember the name of the book I'm reading at the moment. Um, the, uh, it's like movies, you know. If you ask me to name a movie, I'm like... Uh, Watched it, um, it's gone, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so what about your, uh, like, personal qualities? Do you think there's are there particular, like, personal qualities that you've got that have contributed to your success whether that being through through the army or whether that being we're in the business this you know there's a stat out there about how i think it's like 80 percent of the of businesses fail in the first five years and then some another crazy high percentage of the remaining 20 percent then fail before 10 years so you're coming up to this uh if if not well maybe you've celebrated 10 years already if it was 2011 so uh yeah what you've you've done you've done extremely well to get to that point so yeah, what what would you say you've got that has, has like yeah. contributed to that? Well, I'd be interested into like digging deeper. I've heard that stat a bit, and I'd be interested in digging deeper into that because I think that's quite a negative stat to throw about. And um, because you know, you then when you're starting a business, you hear that, and it's pretty intimidating. You think, oh, 90, 80 percent business fail or whatever. You think, fuck, shit, am I going to be okay? 
I'd be really interested to understand how many of those businesses have had people who've actually sort of, they failed because the founders have gone, you know what, actually, I don't want to do this, or this isn't for me, or actually, I had this great idea, but I just haven't followed through on it. Um, and, you know, I've seen quite a few businesses that have come up and started and because people have great ideas and then just haven't kind of followed through and kind of taken it forward and making it happen. So I'd be interested to see how many businesses fail because of actual like failure uh, as a business. I, um, they, you know, or uh, they, they would just, um, yeah, well, I, I'd say I'd be interested to see how many businesses that had at least a kind of relatively solid plan and idea mm-hmm. um, and a, a, a relatively competent management team then went on to fail um, because I reckon that that stat would be a lot lower. Um, and so I, I don't think we've done anything ex- extraordinary at all. I think we've just kind of cracked on with it and kept going, you know, and okay, of course, there's a couple of times where you, you are on a bit of an emotional roller coaster, particularly early on, and you you're you're worried because of you know you don't know if there's going to be money coming in, you don't know what's going to be around, you know what's going to happen next month, and it can be quite easy to kind of walk away from it those situations. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be quite interesting to see how many businesses fail that are actually sort of relatively relatively decent idea and relatively competent people running them. I think I th- yeah no I think you're right on the money uh, the. Uh, it's so it's you know when it is a you know when it is a small business if it is just like a you know a person deciding I'm going to start a business like obviously so much rests on that person's shoulders and what you know sort of tying it back into that like qualities like per- perseverance being a pretty important one where like people like the idea of oh, I'm going to go and start a business but they just don't have the 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 sort of enough desire if you like to keep going when there's a, there's some there's some bumps there or yeah again you know sort of talking on the planning thing like they do just sort of dive in head first and chuck everything at the wall and it's all it's all gone before they even had a chance to get the momentum so like the idea might have been great but uh but yeah it's not necessarily the right the right person but it sounds you know it certainly sounds some of the things you've mentioned already like that planning element to it clearly is a big part in Getting, getting you to where you are because you've you've had some sort of strategic foresight as to where you you know where you're going with it and again like I guess the perseverance thing you you know you wouldn't have done what you know what you've done in your life with all your other stuff if there wasn't an element of perseverance and kind of being happy to step into the unknown and yeah kind of ride that that wave uh, and and yeah there's there's so many people who I guess like the glamorous idea of well I guess it's it, you know kind of into what you were saying of the I want to go and go skiing and like be you know get some income and just go and do what I want to do and I know that as well from my own experiences like the thing that appealed to me was the freedom of it and then you the, the more that time goes on you maybe get to a point where you're less free than you have been when you're sat in a job because there's just too much to do and, and you're a bit trapped yeah, in that you sense. can't walk away from it yeah yeah um, no, there's definitely that, and I, th- I think it's it's certainly not for everyone, and um, and you have to definitely kind of, you know, the motiv- like with anything that's challenging, you know, you can have the motivation to do it, and um, and if you haven't got the motivation, there's kind of there's no point starting. So that's I think that's the first point is you know, am, are you motivated to do this? Do you want to do this? And and if it is, then um, then when things get a little bit when things get tough and when um, or when your confidence dives, you know, you, you can kind of crack on through that and come out the other side. What is your take on failure? Like, how do you view failure? Um, well, I think in, well, not just a business sense, but um, it's certainly something that is should be seen in a kind of positive light. Um, and I think that's definitely, when we're talking about business anyway, Certainly, the Americans do, you know, much better than we do. They're they're quite happy for businesses to kind of go fail, go under, and then you know start again. And, and people see that in a positive light and see it as a, a much more sort of okay, yeah, no, you know, crack on, do something different, um, try again. Whereas I think in in the UK, um, business failure has a has a very negative stigma associated with it that isn't that healthy. 
Um, and so, so yeah, I think we can learn from our American cousins on that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You, in a, again, in a, one of your other interviews that I was reading, you were you were talking about the just take an idea and get on with it, like go and go and do it, take the initial step. <clears throat> That's something I've heard quite a lot from other people. Like when I've been speaking to them here, well, on the podcast here, or when I, you know listening to other people talk, is that um, yeah? Do you do you see that as an important thing? Like, is that would you would you is that your kind of advice you'd give to people just if they've got a if they've got something just to crack on and give it a go? Um, I think it's definitely, um, I think the hardest thing is to take that initial step, right? So, you know, if you decided that this is for you and you want to do it, um, then just do it, just crack on and do it. And, and, you know, before you look, before you realise, you know, a year will have gone by, opportunities will have opened up and you'll be, you'll be in a completely different place. So, you know, you don't know unless you, unless you do it. So rather than, hanging around sort of thinking about it and analyzing it too deep i think it's worth just cracking on and seeing what happens yeah yeah um from i guess you've over over the years you must have been in quite a lot of leadership roles and and obviously leading the business now is have you, yeah have you got a kind of advice on on being a good leader or on you know things Again, like from from the army experience through to kind of what that what that means in a business environment. Um, yeah, good, good question. I think um, you know there's 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 tons written on leadership right all over it, and uh, lots of people have said lots of different things on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think you've just got to, you've just got to be yourself. You know, you've got to just be um, open, honest, sort of with people. Um, be yourself and um you know the, the purpose of leadership as opposed to management is to try and sort of take people with you on your journey as it were so you and uh so i think if you can communicate um or if you have a vision first of all and then can communicate that vision to people and then um and then kind of be yourself then people will hopefully follow you towards that do you find that easy to do? That's one of the things I'm terrible at. Like I try to do that, but then I just always get sucked back into the, you know, the doing and the day to day and meddling with what everyone's everyone's up to. Do you? Yeah. Are you? Is that something you can do and just be like, right, that's your stuff. Go and go and get on with it. As in delegate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then well, uh, de- yeah. delegate in the first place, and then I guess see. It, I, I get. I, you know, I'm. It's not the delegating initially that I struggle with. It's then the leaving people to 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 get on with it, and it's yeah, you know, I'm I'm working hard to get better at that. But it's uh, yeah, I find it a hard thing to not get my controlling claws back into it, which I think comes from being a one man a one man band for a for a good portion of it. So yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I I um, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm comfortable delegating. I hope, at least I hope I am, but. Uh, the, and uh, yeah, ho- hopefully um, let people kind of crack on with uh, and try and sort of what I'd like to do at least is um, uh, try and um, enable people to kind of take ownership of things. And if they take ownership of things, then um, then hopefully they uh, do it to the best of their ability because they, they own it. So so I think that's that's kind of an important thing to bear in mind any tips for that like how in the like make getting them to take ownership of it is it beyond just saying take ownership of this is your thing is there anything extra to kind of throw into that i think you've got to give them some trust um so enable them to sort of take it forward and obviously that um there needs to be some uh some um oversight but it's just tra- working out a way that where you can have oversight without being too intrusive. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, have you got any particular like routines or habits that you'd use to I don't know keep yourself performing performing to a high level? <laughs> I don't know if I perform to a high level, <laughs> but the uh, yeah I. Hey, I guess you know what it's like if you've got young kids and um, family and running a business. Um, it's just about sort of trying to keep all the balls juggled, right? So, 
I, I think, uh, 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 like uh, this isn't rocket science, having some balance in life, but you know, creating space for family, friends, you know, doing exercise. I, I get out mountain biking quite a lot and out, my, out my, you know, road bikes, gravel bikes. So, yeah, just finding some space for the, for the stuff in your life and maintaining that balance, I think, is important. Yeah. Do you have a, because again, you know, this is one speaking, speaking from my own experience, but like get thinking about like that bigger picture for the business and like where it's going. You've talked about having the goals and, and where it's going and being able to articulate that for, for the team and, and that and that side of it. Do you have any things that you do to like facilitate that? Is it again, is it something that comes naturally to you or is it you, when you go on a mountain bike ride that it's like where your head's clears up? Uh, as in the so I guess like where you want to go so yeah you know in a sense of uh, you, you know you might make a plan and be like oh yeah this is what we want to do and, and and listen it might just be that yeah this is what we do and we're going to carry on doing this forever or it might be yeah it's just as that as the thing evolves and you grow and you get you know more people coming in you get bigger coming up with yeah like uh, yeah like where the ideas come from to you know, for how you how you keep developing. Yeah, it's, I guess in terms of like yeah, inspiration. I think you do need to get away from the computer and go out and and get some headspace elsewhere. And yeah, often your best thinking happens yeah on the bike home or on the bike to work or whatever, right? So I think that's yeah, that's super important to create that space to sort of allow your brain to breathe rather than just being you know um, trapped in emails and other shit so yeah no totally i think that's 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 definitely an important part of it yeah T- tell us just uh about some of your favorite your favorite places or adventures that you've that you've done tom so uh yeah if it's a particular place or if it's a particular experience that you've that you've had what what stands out from from what you've done um yeah i guess looking back you know i've been super lucky uh, over the last 10 years and some fun stuff so the I mean, I've done a couple of mountain biking trips that have been really, really cool. So one, one to Afghanistan, um, into the Wakhan. So we, I went back um, and took a, took a team there and we, we did the first kind of mountain biking trip through the Wakhan. Um, really, really quite hard work because you're carrying bikes on your shoulders up at sort of four and a half, five thousand metres. Um, but really, really interesting, rewarding. And bikes, you, you know, are an amazing way to actually break down Break the ice with local communities because you know there's suddenly there's something there that's amazing that's it's, you know they want to see you ride them you know especially if you're with pro mountain bikers you can do you know some pretty impressive stuff and also they want to have a ride you know um they want to have a go and it, it's it's a really good way of breaking the breaking the ice with local communities and we've i found that now we've done trips to you know northern iraq um north korea Ethiopia, Afghanistan, and that's it's been really effective, you know, everywhere. So, so yeah, that first trip to Afghanistan certainly stood out as um, physically very tough, like incredibly tough challenge. And we had a couple of, you know, we we couldn't get over one of the passes because the snow was too soft and the, the pack animals couldn't get through the snow. So we had to do a, quite a large detour round, which is pretty pretty challenging. But um, um, but yeah, also super rewarding. And then. Also um, did a great trip across Madagascar. First kind of, uh, we you know we love doing sort of pioneering stuff, and this was the first time this route had been attempted over over some mountains through a jungle, and then hit a river and, and um, rafted down the river uh, to the sea. So we were you know hitting the rapids. Well, we weren't hitting the blinds. We knew, but no one had sort of run that river before, so it was a kind of first descent on on, on the rafts that we were using. Which was which was super cool. Um, again, you know, physically quite challenging, uh, but also yeah, really really good fun and really interesting culturally. Great, you know. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was uh, a um, so yeah, I've been quite lucky in terms of what I've been able to do. Yeah. What what advice would you give to someone who was thinking of starting a yeah starting a business? Is it is it that is it that just kind of take your idea and, and run with it. Is there anything else you'd throw in there as someone who's sat thinking that they're, they're, they're considering starting a business in, in travel in some shape or form? 
Yeah, I think it, it's totally is kind of. I'd always encourage people to go for it. Um, I, I think the first one is is just assess your motivations. Make sure you've got the right motivations. Um, but buckle in for the ride and, and go for it. Ace. And what what is the plan for like for Secret Compass? Where do you yeah where do you see it going? What's the is there anything on the horizon for the next you know next five years or the ten years down the line? Yeah, well we're um you know we've we've evolved a little bit in, and we're um we've developed a new a new media brand base. So we've launched Base Magazine uh, about two years ago now, uh, which is super exciting. And so we're we're really excited about where we can take Base as a as a content distributor you know through our magazine through our online portal and also through um through content production through base films so i think that's where we're we're going to focus our effort over the next few years um and look at how we can we can develop a venture in a, in a slightly different way yeah hey sounds good sounds good um anything else before we finish anything else you'd like to share anything else like that just to do with the business uh yeah any, any final comments? Um, no, I think that's it. I think, you know, uh, I guess if this is this is aimed at people who are, you know, looking about, talking about business or looking at business, I, I think it's, yeah, it's it's a great journey. There's always there's always new challenges every day. There's always new new things cropping up. It's certainly sort of all-consuming, but it's also can be super fun. Cool. Where, where can we find you, Tom? What's the URL or the website? Anywhere? Social media like uh, handles you wanna you wanna shout out? Yeah, so we're we're just secretcompass.com and and base-mag.com. Amazing. Good stuff. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate you coming on. It's been great See to talk Tom. to you. Speak to you soon. You too. Thanks, Tom. Bye. And there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that episode and you've scrolled down lots of the tips that Tom shared there, which I've no doubt will help any organization make progress. If you go to secretcompass.com for more information, you'll find links to the various social channels and to follow Secret Compass and Tom in a bit more detail. Also check out base-mag.com, which shares some unbelievable stories that Tom mentioned. Uh, so some cool stuff from the adventure space there, such as a one-eyed 80-year-old woman who does a 600-mile journey on horseback every year and has done since 1971. And if that doesn't float your boat, I don't know what will. Yeah, you can also go to seotravel.co.uk forward slash Tom hyphen Bodkin. So that's T-O-M hyphen B-O-D-K-I-N for all the show notes and the links to the things that Tom and I mentioned there. You can also watch the video of the conversation there or visit seotravel.co.uk forward slash podcast and you can find the other episodes that we've recorded so far where there's lots of other insight too. If you're a travel company looking for marketing support from people who really care about your progress, then please do get in touch at seotravel.co.uk and we'd love to hear from you. You can also read about our 100% project there, which outlines how we give all the profit we make to educational charities, both at home and around the world. We'd love your support in spreading the word so we can help those charities as much as we possibly can. If you enjoyed the show, it would be fantastic if you could review us on iTunes and share what your favourite bits were there. Subscribe to it. It'd be amazing if you could share it with at least one person you know who you think could benefit from the insight that Tom shared with us then. If you haven't already, give our other episodes a listen. We've had some incredible stories from our guests so far and we've got more great people coming up as well. So stay tuned for future episodes. And if you do subscribe, then you'll be the first to get notified when we do release new episodes and be one step ahead of the game. Otherwise, thanks so much for listening. We've loved having you. Hope you enjoyed it. And until next time. Happy travels.